I'm really glad to see all of you today because I know that you don't really want to be here. It's between semesters and you would like to be taking a little rest. Frankly, I don't want to be here either. Don't really have anything to say today. Don't know why I took this appointment. But I'm here. And you're here. So I thought what I'd do is I'd just drop my Bible open. We'd have something from the Lord to take up our time. And uh, then we can go on our way. I just opened it up, drop it open. It opens to the 26th chapter of the book of Leviticus. And of all things, it's talking about something that we don't even need. It doesn't even apply to us. But I want to look at it anyway. Of all things, it deals with idolatry. Are any of y'all idol worshipers? I don't know why. I was just open to this, but let's make a go at it anyway. <clears throat> Verse 1 starts out like this. You shall not make idols for yourselves or erect an image or pillar, and you shall not set up a figured stone in your land to bow down to it, for I am the Lord your God. You shall keep my Sabbaths and reverence my sanctuary. I am the Lord. Now all of you Bible readers know that the book of Leviticus doesn't apply to us anyway. It's for children of Israel. It's written only to the children of Israel. It's about Jewish worship. doesn't apply to us at all. But probably we ought to look at it because hermeneutically what we do is we read these stories to learn about God and how God deals with things, especially how He deals with His people and, and we're His people. And, and uh, there may be some principles in here that are eternal, divine principles that may have some application to us if we look at it closely. So if you'll stay with me, we'll read on. He says, If you walk in my statutes and observe my commandments and do them, then I will give you rains in, your se in their seasons, and the land shall uh, yield an increase, and the trees of the field shall yield their fruit. Your threshing shall last to the time of the grape harvest, and the grape harvest shall last to the time for sowing, and you shall eat your bread to the full and dwell in the land securely. I will give peace in the land and you shall lie down and none shall make you afraid and I'll remove harmful beasts from the land and the sword shall not go through your land. You shall chase your enemies and they shall fall before, your, your, before uh, you by the sword. Five of you will chase a hundred and a hundred of you will chase 10,000 uh, and your enemies shall fall before you by the sword. And I will turn to you and make you fruitful and multiply you and you can, uh, and will confirm my covenant with you. And you shall eat old store long kept and you shall clear out the old to make way for the new. I will make my dwelling among you and my soul shall not abhor you. And I'll walk among you and you will, uh, and I will be your God and you shall be my people. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt that you should not be their slaves, and I have broken the bars of your yoke and made you walk erect. Wonderful blessings on the children of Israel to have a God like that, and one who would talk like that, and all he's asking them to do is to have no other God before them, just like Ten Commandments. First commandment was, Thou shalt have no other God before me, and you're not to make any graven image, Number two, and you keep my Sabbath, you honor me. You know the dumb children of Israel, the ignorant folks, they didn't do that in spite of the fact that the Lord said, if you don't do what I say, here's what's going to happen to you. <clears throat> if you do not learn 
Listen, if you don't learn to listen to me and will not do all these commandments, if you spurn my statutes and if your soul abhors my rules so that you will not do all my commandments but break my covenant, then I'll do this to you. Listen carefully. I will visit you with panic, with wasting disease, and fever that consume the eyes and make the heart ache. You shall sow your seed in vain, for your enemies shall eat it. I will set my face against you, and you shall be struck down before your enemies. Those who hate you shall rule over you, and you shall flee when none pursues you. And if in spite of this you will not listen to me, then I will discipline you again sevenfold for your sins. And I'll break the pride of your power, and I'll make your heavens like iron and your earth like bronze. And your strength shall be spent in vain, for your land shall not yield its increase, and the trees of the land shall not yield their fruit. Then if you walk contrary to me and will not listen to me, I will continue striking you sevenfold for your sins. And I'll let loose the wild beasts against you, which shall bereave you of your children and destroy your livestock and make you few in number so that your roads shall be deserted. And if by this discipline you're not turned to me, but walk contrary to me, then will I also walk contrary to you. And I myself will strike you sevenfold for your sins, and I'll bring a sword upon you that shall execute vengeance for the covenant. And if you gather within your cities, I'll send pestilence among you, and you shall be delivered into the hand of the enemy. When I break your supply of bread, ten women shall bake your bread in a single oven and shall dole it out, uh, the bread by weight, and you shall eat and not be satisfied. But if in spite of this you will not listen to me, but walk contrary to me, then will I walk contrary to you in fury, and I myself will discipline you sevenfold for your sins. You shall eat the flesh of your sons and of your daughters, and I will destroy your high places and cut down your incense altars and cast your dead bodies upon the bo dead bodies of your idols, and my soul will abhor you. And then in verse 32, he says, I myself will devastate the land. I don't know about you, but I find that pretty interesting. We learn something about our God. You know, when I think about idols, I don't think of myself as an idolater. You know what an idol is? The Hebrew word, I understand, that speaks of idols is a thing of nothingness. A thing of nothingness. Now, I think we know what that means. If you have a Buddha or a god, little gods that sit on the shelves or whatever, they may have eyes, but they can't see. And God says that about idols. He said they have eyes that can't see, ears that can't hear you, and arms that can't bless you. They're things of nothingness. Makes no difference. They can't act. But what God is saying is, I'm an actor. I can act in your favor or against you. And so this passage in chapter 26 that we just looked upon today, man, what he's talking about is the difference between obedience and disobedience. Isn't that profound? Some of us began learning that as children. We forget it as adults. 
when we understand that instead of answering to our parents solely, we answer to God. And instead of depending on our parents, who were good and faithful servants to us, we're dependent upon God, who is a greater, more dependent, more able servant for us. And if a little boy can walk beside his daddy and stand in front of anybody and just say, don't bother me, they're my daddy. And we can face anything as God's children. He says, I'll walk with you. I'll be among you. But we know from reading the rest of the Bible, if we walk with God, we've got to go where he goes because he chooses the path his way. But if I walk with him, I have perfect trust and confidence. No matter come, come what may, my Heavenly Father's with me. You know what? He can do anything. He can protect me from anything. Why would I choose a thing of nothingness to serve? Obedience. This passage talks about three things in the first three verses. He says, Don't make any idols or set up any image because I, the Lord, am your God. Our God's a jealous God. He won't put up with any kind of rival. So he says, observe my Sabbaths. Observe my Sabbaths and have reverence for my sanctuary. I'm the Lord. If you follow my decrees and are careful to obey my commands, then I'll give you all these blessings. If you don't do it, instead of walking with you, I'm going to walk against you. Have you ever tried to walk against God? It doesn't work. And all these problems come upon us. The obedient will make no idols. You say, well, we don't do that in our country. Do we have any American idols? Think about some. We idolize youth, do we not? You've got to be young, but the young get old. We keep trying to stay young. <clears throat> but there's some kind of shame in getting old and wrinkled. And when our bodies begin to give way to gravity and we begin to go back to dust, but isn't it strange that God would have us to honor the aged, the old age? But we got a different idol. We idolize beauty. We're the most beautiful nation that ever lived. If we weren't born that way, we fix it. We tack it up, we cut it off, we lift it up, we paint it. We're the most beautiful people. We idolize beauty. A thing of nothingness. Now, there's nothing wrong with being beautiful. Most of us appreciate beauty. But like youth, it passes away. The most beautiful women that ever lived in the last century are dead. It's a thing of nothingness. We have a tendency to idolize power, prestige, and wealth. You say, all oh, that's necessary. It's, it's, it's admirable, and, but it passes away. It's a thing of nothingness. You know, J. Paul Getty, and Howard Hughes, Andrew Carnegie, <clears throat> they're all dead. 
What about their wealth? <clears throat> they left it all. Their wealth and power belong to somebody else. It's all vanity, a thing of nothingness. But to get closer to home, <clears throat> I idolize my own opinions, <laughs> my own ideas. I want my songs. I want to be a leader. We sometimes strain our relationships because of selfishness. I want my way. Self is a costly idol, a thing of nothingness. That's what I am. You know, I need to pause right here and confess my own idolatry. One cannot trust God while trusting oneself. See, I never thought of myself as idolatrous because I worship Jehovah, too. Also, Israel would think of themselves as monolithic, serving only God, but they had idols. I think of myself that way. But it's easy to think of self as more important than we are before that which is high and holy. We ought to worship the eternal, not the temporal. Homage should be paid to the one who was dead and is alive forevermore. Homage should be prayed to the kingdom which can never be shaken. And homage should be paid to the word of God, which lives and abides forever. I think to summarize all this is just to say that the obedient do not have idols. And since we're so prone to idolatry, we are constantly confessing and hopefully repenting. Paul told the Colossian brethren, who would have thought that we're not idolaters, we don't have any idolatry, we serve the Lord. He said that greed is idolatry. Greed plagues our nation. Now if you go back and you'll read the last part of what we read from Leviticus, you read about a nation that becomes idolatrous and what's going to happen to the nation. But scripture is full of what happens to the individual as well who embraces idolatry. You and I may not be totally responsible for the demise of the nation of America as Israel lost their position in the world. We may be a participant in it. We may just be closing our eyes to it. But the things we read are happening in our country. You know what's happening to our economy? You know what's happening to our farmlands? You know what's happening to our, our enemies? <clears throat> and our strength in regard to our enemies? And do you know what's happening to our children? The wild beasts are getting our children. In the body of Christ, statistically, one out of every four of our children raised in the church are no longer faithful in adulthood. I love my children. That's enough cause me to want to just go back to God and focus on Him and serve Him wholly and completely. At least I think that's what 
we ought to get out of the 26th chapter of Leviticus. I hope you'll read the whole thing. And I'm so glad I stumbled up on it this morning.